Hi everyone, welcome to Back Chat. Welcome to Yoga Berry, your yoga for your community. We are live, and I can see some of you are already joining and tuning in. Um, so let us know if you can hear us okay, if all the, the tech is functioning. It looks like everything is fine. Let us know where you're from. So this is an, an interactive um, show, and we do this every Wednesday. We talk about scoliosis, um, we talk about back care, we talk about living with scoliosis. And sometimes it's just me talking about a specific topic, and sometimes I've got guests here as well. So today I do have a fabulous guest, um, and her name is Suzanne Martin. And I came across her originally um, via Yoga U Online, which is a great resource for, for yoga teachers, actually, who want to kind of learn more um, about teaching yoga, about anatomy and, and all of these things, kind of diving a little bit deeper. And she had a great, great course on there um, about scoliosis and working with people with scoliosis. She has written a fabulous book as well. And um, I was really interested in, in learning more about what she does. And she is, she's coming more from a Pilates background. So that will be really, really interesting, obviously, to, to get her feedback. She is a um, physical therapist as well. So let me bring her on right now. So there she is. Hi, Suzanne. Hello, Christine. <laughs> thank you thank so, you so much. much. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to um to to talk to me which is which is amazing really really good and guys if you are watching this live or if you are watching this on the replay then it's going to be harder but if you are here live then feel free to let us know any questions if you've got any questions um then i will make sure i will i will read them out to suzanne she can't see them right now um <laughs> but i can put them forward to her as well Good. So, um, Suzanne, I would love to know how how did you get to be so amazing? <laughs> how did you? Um, what is your your background? How did you get into this topic? Because it's such a niche topic, right? There aren't that many people who are so knowledgeable in in this area of, of movement and scoliosis. Um, so, would you mind telling us a little bit about your journey with scoliosis? Well, Christine, again, thank you for having me and hello everyone. And thank you for joining us and for all the people in the scoliosis community, because it's always um, such a pleasure to just share our knowledge and how we can support one another in our life journeys, you know? And so, uh, you know, I've been on a long journey with scoliosis and I was it was so nice to chat with Christine ahead of time and just to tell her a little bit about my background. And so, uh, you know, I actually come from the dance world and I was largely uh, self-diagnosed really because I had a very hyperflexible back. And so I was one of those people that could stand on the foot and bring the, foot, the other foot over the head. And, you know, so that was like super fun. Um, and so I think lots of times too, that people who were super flexible, one is that from research, we're finding out that probably people who are hyperflexible actually really have a straight spine, that it's more of like missing the actual curves that you need, the gravitational curves, the S curves. And so unfortunately, that kind of spine type is more prone to develop more, um, you know, kind of offsets, I would say, uh, you know, and to say how I got into it, I had a... Um, an early injury when I was about maybe 12 and I grew up in the south part of the U.S. close to the Gulf of Mexico. We used to vacation a lot there and they have very strong waves. And so I was this little kid and I'm doing front flips and I'm doing back flips and they have the strong waves. Well, I got caught in a back flip in where a wave pounded me when my head got pushed back behind my pelvis in a crunch. And I can remember walking up on the beach and I saw my sister, who was six years older than me, my sister, that I said, Mary, I think I broke my back. And she said, no, you didn't, stupid, because you're standing up. So then I thought, well, that's that. You know, <laughs> so I didn't tell my parents. 
But, you know, honestly, I think that just sometimes um, that for those of us who I was small, you know, I'm 5'2", and that's also associated with um, developing scoliosis is like somebody with a small frame that I'm, I actually take off. I, I take um, after my Aunt Ruby Kate, you know, I'm from the South. <laughs> and uh, so people are young, especially women, you know, and I uh, developed late, you know, so the longer that you don't go through menses and then something where you have an initial accident, if, you know, it can just start to make the spine grow asymmetrically. Mm -hmm. So mine wasn't super obvious, but then as I got older and I was, uh, then I was bounced off of a stage when I was in my um, kind of mid twenties, when I was going to in a performance, because I then went into the dance world of course, because I had this hyperflexibility, right? Doesn't everybody do that? And uh, <clears throat> I didn't join the circus, but I went into dance. <laughs> I don't think I was strong enough for the circus. You know, I was a little too weeny. So I'm stronger now. So the thing is, is that <clears throat> I, when I got bounced off the stage in my right hip, then, uh, you know, I'm young, I'm strong. It's like, ha, 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 ha. You know, it's kind of fun to be bounced around. My teachers are all like, are you all right? You know, are you Okay. And so I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. And then a few weeks later, then back spasms started. And so um, that was inconvenient. And I don't know if you've had those kind of back spasms, uh, Christine, but um, they're really disorienting. Mm. Like, um, because also I think in, with my hyperflexibility, and, and actually I've let myself stiffen up. I mean, that scared me so much yeah. that I let myself stiffen up, which was maybe not the best thing to do. You know, I wish I had people like me, you know, to help me then back when I was younger, but thank God I found Pilates. But anyway, what they said is, okay, well, we're going to send you to this little old lady in the Berkeley Hills and she's an osteopath. And so finding this place was intense because she was a retired obstetrician who had gone into osteopathy and she was seeing patients in her pool house. In, you know, and finding any address in the Berkeley Hills is like trying to find, I mean, you can probably identify that with, you know, like mm -hmm. the British lands, right? <laughs> countryside. It's kind of like that. So anyway, I found her and uh, actually it was a profound experience because there's, she was very old and she would just look at you and kind of whistle as she walked around. She was like in her eighties then. Um, and uh, she didn't give a lot of information, but she looked at my feet. She said, you're a dancer. <laughs> Yes. She goes, well, your feet are kind of fat and flabby for a dancer. <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, really? <laughs> so, um, so she didn't say what to do about it. You know, that was not helpful. <laughs> okay. But, um, but actually then that, it was the first time I actually ever felt my organs swirl around in my abdomen when mm. she treated me. So I never even remotely thought that I'd go toward that realm and actually that is similar to the kind of manual therapy I do now. But anyway, you know, fast forward. So now, um, you know, then I'm being asked, I'm getting these injuries, you know, <laughs> as I'm trying to get harder and harder into the dance world. So then I get introduced to Pilates, which had just come to the San Francisco area. And then they're saying, they're like, we need teachers. And so then they said, well, let's train you. And I was like, cool, I, I need everything I can get. And so, you know, so that was amazing. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, cause I'm so petite. And I don't know how tall you are. I'm five one and three quarters inches tall, and I I don't know what the metrics are on that, but um, yeah, know. I'm five seven, which is yeah one seventy. So, well, I don't smaller than that. Yeah, <laughs> I don't fit in gym equipment. Okay. Yeah, I don't fit in chairs. All that kind of stuff. I mean, what mm. a drag! I spent half of my high school years with my forearms on the table. You know, so that's a typical hallmark of scoliosis, of weak spine. I had a super flexible spine, but mm -hmm. and I had no clue on how to strengthen it. So anyway, I did actually believe in that. One of my um, cousins brought me into a yoga class when I was about 17 or 18. I thought, I'm pretty good at this, you know? And so, but I didn't go into yoga. I went into dance instead. And, and actually, please forgive me for all you dancers out there. Listen, I've been in the dance field for 50 years. I'm in the dance medicine world. I love, 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 love dance. I've been a phys physical therapist for a ballet company in San Francisco for 25 years. It's not enough. Hmm. And so this is what I teach people. I say, look, you have to protect your talent. 
your talent's not enough. Like you're going to, I say, don't self-sabotage. So yoga, Pilates, anything else you can find, Franklin Method, Feldenkrais, Christ, all that stuff. Hmm. You know, and I to tell people, look, Pilates is a piece of the pie. But Pilates helped me because I needed like the mid-range kind of resistance. So yeah. you see in yoga, I mean, I could do like the worst thing, which is to get to the end range and say, I'm fabulous, you know, and I wasn't. And so then as I'm an aerobics teacher, because I'm trying to get fit. So I got stronger. And then, you know, I used to wear these little jogging shorts and I'd have these fun, you know, fun students that come up and say, your little shorts are completely turned around the other way. So in other words, I'm so asymmetric mm. that, you know, like I can't do the movement symmetrically, right? Like everything's kind of twisting and I don't even know it, right? So then um, Pilates afforded me to start recalibrating what's more of like a good idea, vertical neutral, mm -hmm. right? And so Michelle Larson is one of our um, longtime teachers in Pilates. And it was really when she, she has scoliosis herself. And, you know, it, it, you know, and that's the thing that's so crazy making, I think, is that I represent, I think, a lot of people with this kind of condition is that, you see, and forgive me for saying this, you said that you were identified early by screening. Well, I don't remember screening, but the thing is when people are more hyperflexible, they can hide any of this kind of um, on off the lines kind of situation. Yeah. So Michelle, you know, basically kind of sh showed me, oh my God, you know, that's what it is. It's like, well, okay. Is that why my right pelvis is always forward? And that's why I always had a difference like in my pelvis, that it would be like the soft tissue on the right side would bulge out more and the left was always a little bit more tilted. And so then I just thought I had pelvic oblique rate. So I actually went into physical therapy school. I mean, not because I wanted, I wanted to try to give more um, depth to Pilates to make more justification for it. Mm -hmm. But really, honestly, it was selfish that I was trying to just figure out what is wrong with me? <laughs> what is wrong with me? Like why, you know, why, you know, I had spinal x-rays to, to start working, believe it or not, at the St. Francis, because they have to see if you're healthy. Mm. And, you know, and nobody, I mean, so if you're in that minimal range or if you have instability, and maybe that's what's wrong with me, maybe I have actually more instability than what's called a deformity. Mm. And frankly, I try really hard. And there's a, uh, an organization called Curvy Girls, which has put out yeah. a, um, you know them? formal request because i'm a member of so sore and let me see if i can mm -hmm. get this right. society on scoliosis orthopedic rehabilitation and therapy and so i'm a member of that and you know you have to kind of be accepted into that society um <clears throat> which i don't blame them you know um and then, yeah, of course it's you know it's it's all about the conservative care mm -hmm. of scoliosis which is an awesome thing but they didn't start coming up until around 2006. And I started to do presentations. Well, first I did presentations on pelvic obliquity. And I hooked up, I say hooked up, but I started to coordinate with a man who's an osteopath in Montreal. And he treats like about seven different dance companies in, in Canada. And so then I started to learn about more osteopathic things. And actually he was pushing me to actually go to osteopathic school. I was like, oh my God, I'm too old for this. Like, <laughs> I, can't, I just can't do it. But frankly, I did go ahead and get my doctorate in physical therapy. Huh. But the thing is, is that, um, you know, I've studied all those manual therapies, all more like the soft touch, touch ones. So I got my fossil training back in the late nineties before Tom Myers got, got mm -hmm. So I was trained primarily through John Barnes's uh, organization. And then I studied a lot of osteopathic um, type of things. I studied strain, counter strain. I've studied visceral manipulation, cranial sacral work, all that kind of stuff. Because in some ways I felt like um, it, it's like treating an adolescent. You can't over treat people. And when you're working with people with scoliosis, like you don't want to be cranking their spines around. And then when you're working with hyperflexible people, like, you know, you have to be careful, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you just want to change them. So I kind of went toward that. And so all these things kind of dovetail. And then I had people pushing me because I started out with giving these sacral presentations. I gave upper back presentations, you know, all this kind of stuff. And then they said, Suzanne, like, it's time. And I gave hypermobility ones, you know? 
and nutritional stuff. I started, I taught nutrition lectures at the School of the San Francisco Ballet for about six or seven years. And then I became a writer for Dance Magazine, Dance Studio Life. And actually, um, believe it or not, this book is actually my fourth book. And so um, wow. I did three <clears throat> by with a, a British publisher, Dwelling Kindersley, and those are fitness books. And so um, I did the first one on stretching and people will say, well, this is yoga. I'm like, I tried to have, give it more of a fascial bent, but I was not allowed to use the term fascia at that time. Oh, <laughs> wow. Thanks for the rest. Well, it's controversial. <laughs> yeah. And then, so then yeah. I came up with this 15 minute series and I did the 15 minute series and all my, my, my models were yoga teachers. <laughs> and um, then, then I, then they said, Oh, we want you to do one on the back. I said, Oh, perfect. I said, I have four diagnoses. They said, Suzanne, we don't do diagnoses here. I'm like, I said, listen, I mean, I said, I kept trying to plug the scoliosis book. I kept trying to plug it. And they're like, we, you know, we can't do that. So then am I going on too much about this? No, no, no. Okay. I just want to make sure I'm not boring anybody. No, no. Boring anybody. No, I it's said, great. It's amazing. It because what happened was, is that then I came out with something called Better Back. And frankly, that sold really well. And actually it came down, and it's like in German, it's in, Finnish, it's you know, I mean, that's how they sell it. It's like every language, they're two different French languages, right? One Canadian, one continental, yeah. And um, and they're like, What do you mean by core? And I'm like, Apple core, um, nuclear core, you know, it's like it's, so that was before core was being used, you know. Um, and it's true, like, how do you translate this stuff, mm. right? So, I, it's it, it's made me think a lot. Thank you, editors, and so, um, so anyway. Somebody pushed me to start making actual specialization programs. In 2011, I started the first one. So what I did was, is I took like my pelvic uh, core course and I took, you know, a number of um, other ones. I had done some preliminary, uh, some I needed to make like a little home program with springs for some kid and I put that on a video. And so I, I had people looking at that. Now I have a whole wedge series because I came up with a product that helps to just make things a little bit more balanced. But, uh, but the thing is, is then then they go through those kind of video courses and then we, we did an intensive at my, my house in California. So we did that until just a little bit before the pandemic because I knew that I was going to move. Um, yeah. So, but the thing is, and then we started to really develop a lot of material and they helped me to develop the use of the wedge. So my material really is kind of peer reviewed. So then I was asking my editor from um, Dawn Kindersley, I said, where can I, you know, is there anybody who would publish this? I said, I have a lot of material now. And so, you know, I even um, sent one into Elsevier because I thought it's not really fitness. It's not really medical. Where does this fit? And so, uh, cause I want to help people who are movement educators mm -hmm. understand because this is where people end up because there's a lot of people like me who are not like medically a dire, thank God, right? Yeah, uh, at times I am, but for right now, <laughs> I'm not medically dire, and I'm trying to avoid being med medically dire as I get older. You know, so that's the trick. You know, it's like mm -hmm. how do you not become disabled? And so that's actually a course that I'm going to come out with soon. Um, mm. But um, so anyway, I was I was actually in London at the breakfast table with Elizabeth Larkham, who trained me originally in Pilates, and I, I was whining to her. I said. Elizabeth, I have all this material and I'm being turned down by these publishers because, you know, um, and because they say that it doesn't fit in their system. And she pulls out her phone. She, she types in the number. She says, Serena, I want you to talk to Suzanne. And she hands the phone to me. I was like, oh, my gosh. So then I talked to this publisher from Handspring and she says, oh, yeah, well, submit, you know, a proposal. Well, it's not as, that simple to submit a proposal. And I'll show you the wedge in a minute. It, it's not that simple. And so then that got peer reviewed over the entire world. And it was great because it's like body workers. Let me turn the camera mm. a bit more to me. It's like <clears throat> body workers, physical therapists, Pilates people. So, I mean, that's when I, who I'm talking to, yoga people, you know, kind of all together. We're, or we're like a movement educator community. Yeah. And I tell people, look, and forgive me, anybody who's a Pilates instructor, I, my Pilates head too, Pilates is a piece of the pie. It's a piece of the pie. So we need, you know, we have, need to figure out how to work 
I want people to be able to take my material and have the joy of going to other classes mm. to know how to handle themselves yeah. when they're in another person's space. And, you know, because don't, you know, I remember that there was some yoga teacher who I will not name that I do use her products. And she got up on that stage and she said, I want everyone to know I'm self-educated. I said, wait a minute, you have gray hair. You've been in yoga for 30 years and you're self-educated? <laughs> no. So, I mean, I'm what does that even mean? <laughs> yeah. And I was like, OMG. <laughs> okay. So, wait, I'll show you. So, I want you to know. Mm -hmm. Yes, the wedge is, you know, and I'll show you. I'm actually going to do a little, you know, Christine wanted to do a little exercise too. And we'll do that too. But this is kind of the way that it looks mm -hmm. package like this. And then, you know, and obviously there's many wedges on the market and I can show you some of my other ones. These are the yeah. ones I came up with. And so I actually, um, it was, a, it was somebody I was working with in England who helped me then to go to a product developer because I, it's not the same thing as a yoga wedge. It actually, the density is different. Mm. So, I, so what I did was, is because some of the wedges are made out of cloth and are like too spongy and then push a person. Yeah, I'm so just my, looking for mine here. To yeah, show the I, difference. see, this is why I try to make a difference and you just accumulate. I mean, I've been accumulating so many products for so many years. Yeah, you mm. see, there's another one. And so just- But these are really hard. So oh, okay, hard. These, well, are, these are quite hard. So that's why I, I don't really like them because, um, yeah. Well, that's I find them many, difficult. you know, I can bring out others, you know, I have Karina Tex. I actually yeah. have big upholstered ones that you use in manual therapy. I mean, you know, <laughs> we all need a lot of tools because people who come in the door, everybody's different. Yeah. So this is why I resisted uh, doing assessments it's just by saying two curve, three curve, four curve. Well, a lot of people think that they're doing shroff designations, but frankly, that's not how it works. Hmm. If you actually study Schroth and you did, you took that introductory course, mm -hmm. it's much more complicated. Yeah. So one is that, well, forgive me for saying this, like right off, is that honestly, we have to try really hard not to compete with other health professionals in terms of, do I really know better than that surgeon? Do I really know better than what that PT is saying? Do I really know better than what this conservative osteopath is saying? Because I wrote to a really famous osteopath asking to do a forward for me. I won't name him because he's wonderful and he's helped me so much with, you know, with mm -hmm. what his knowledge is. But he says, Suzanne, I can't give you the, and this was interesting. He says, I can't give write a forward for this because I know these instructors are not going to do what you say. And I said, listen, doctor, the fact is they're already doing it. I said, if we don't try to give some guidance, then, you know, everybody's just shooting in the dark. Mm. So this yeah. is why, you know, I've really tried to learn from all the people who have come to my specialization programs. I still learn from them. I did four online virtual hybrid courses where I send out recordings ahead of time and then we meet online and I tried to make it accommodating to you know time zones because I realized I'm on the east coast time in the United States even the west coast time is like horrendous difference like it's three hour difference and then going to England that's another five hour difference and then going into I work a lot in Asia and that gets to be between either a 12 to 16 hour difference right and then Australia is different you know so we're all really different in our time zones but it seems to work for people you know, so I'm, and actually I had, I had people ask me for years, you know, do you do anything online? So when I had to pivot with COVID and I had to pivot with moving here to the East Coast, it's helped me to still keep the community and the material building. Mm. And so, so, you know, yeah. I have to give out evaluations to get approval for continuing education. And my butt has been fried and for good reason. You know, just like every editor who's <laughs> who's read my work, uh, you know, they're like, what? You know, <laughs> so, 
you know, as, as hard as it is to listen to all this stuff, you know, and please be kind. Okay. I asked you just, you know, you can give me definitely feedback, but let's just be nice about it. Huh? Mm, I had one yeah. feedback one time from a PMA conference that said, I am so tired about hearing Suzanne's melodies. I can't <laughs> stand it anymore. And okay, I'm sorry. I've got some hyperflexibility. I've had some joint issues from it. I've got some spinal instability. And this is why I'm sharing it so that because I'm trying to help other people who have these conditions. Mm, yes. And sorry, sorry if I'm interrupting you. And I know you have because like you have so much knowledge. And you know, honestly, when I when I watched your your course, <clears throat> especially the first kind of half of it, it was like a big wave of <laughs> of things you were you were giving us, which is amazing. Um, but I do want to make sure that people really get um, the really, really the 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 really good and good bits and pieces out of it. So what I loved was, you know, you said it already that you've got so many things that you bring together and all the knowledge, and you you're always learning and you're always uh, kind of developing your your ideas and your knowledge further, which is which is fantastic. So in this on this podcast or on on this live stream uh people know that you know i've been learning about schroth and that um obviously we i had some schroth people on here and there is a lot of talk of don't do this don't do that don't twist don't back bend don't side bend if prefer preferably just be in neutral the whole time <laughs> and um <clears throat> strengthen in this position. Then when I watched your course and when I watched your practical side, you were not afraid to show twisting. You were talking about spiral lines. Um, uh, there was backbending in there. Um, so so tell me a little bit about this because I know you are, you are a qualified Schroth therapist as well. So how does this, in your brain, how does this fit together? How can you, how do you combine these two things? These it's two a super ideas? challenge. Yeah, it's a super challenge. And frankly, when I start my course off is that you always start in neutral. I mean, one is that you're trying to help somebody just recalibrate what neutral is. And frankly, I don't know that um, we go directly into back bends or anything like that. What I do is supported supported kind of um kind of torso reshaping is what i prefer to call it mm -hmm. with the fascia and so we have arcs to lie on and then we pad people to try to start stretching now the thing is is that you have to pick and choose how severe this is yeah if somebody's 80 years old and they come in with an 80 degree curve like you're not going to be doing that with them no i mean you have to be like a little bit bright right so the thing is, is, is that with, um, with youth in general, they tend to be more flexible and more pliable. And part of it is that if you can teach somebody how to do a side bend, I mean, I'm side bending with support right now to teach them how to do that. It took me years to be able to get my waist under control mm -hmm. you know, and to get my butt underneath me. You know, so I think that um, even though I had what I think was probably too straight of a spine, my thoracic is still too flat. I've done so much exercise to build up my thoracic curve. Mm -hmm. you know, and I still do that almost every day because of my, you know, flexibility. So I don't think that Schroth is wrong to want to put someone in neutral because I think that's the way you begin. But again, I believe that there's... Um, that I have like these philosophies, the three E philosophy of ergonomics, exercise and emotion, and that it's a process. There's three kinds of movement education, one somatic. And part of it is that in physical therapy, sometimes there's not time to help someone to start to feel internally where their skeleton is, hmm. what that feels like. So, um, I think that there has to be some time devoted to that. And so you can't put somebody completely to sleep the whole time in a session. But then I think besides the somatic is then the corrective. And I think that yeah. physical therapy tends to get stuck in correctives. And I think that leaves a lot of questions in people's mind. But one thing from the Schroth training I've done 
they really do try to educate people, but it takes a while to like get it because yes. in our minds, especially if you've reached, you know, some sort of adulthood <laughs> when you're like 20, when pretty much the skeleton's considered closed, but from teaching my nutrition lectures that I did for six years at school of San Francisco ballet and working with young people and watching them develop, like your skeleton might close at 16, but your musculature is probably not developed until you're 21 or 22. So it's not only trying to be in this critical period, and actually you can have a huge effect. So if somebody decides to have, you know, a really, you know, dedicated time to stopping the scoliosis when they're like 12 to 16, have at it. Now, a lot of people who are in the dance world, that's just not going to be feasible not to ever bend your back or not yeah. to decide. So to me, what you have to do is strengthen them. I have a whole youth program that works on just strengthening. So we have somatic, corrective, and then conditioning. So part of it is to help kids to build bone strength. And um, Bissage Roth is a French surgeon uh, from the Lyon Method, Dr. Jean-Claude de Maroy. And he actually says, you know, go out, run. It's all about bone strengthening because it happens a lot with osteopenia. Mm. So this is why people who are like teenagers are at risk. And then as they go into menopause, they're at risk. And, and frankly, then also, even though somebody can have a successful pregnancy, and also I've taken obstetrics courses in PT, and frankly, even though somebody can deliver with scoliosis, it's still a tricky proposition. Okay. And yeah. getting, if you want to get an epidural, it's stick, still a sticky proposition. It's not as easy. You can do well, but it's a process. Mm. And so, I mean, I've had clients that went from like a 40 degree curve to a 60 degree curve after having two kids, but it depends upon somebody's connective tissue flexibility, the rigidity of the, of where the, the curves have developed. And I concentrate on the concavities. Now, Schroth method actually does concentrate more on the concavities and in like in the um, in the manual therapy world where with the Ida Rolf world all of that that's when I first started to learn about opening up the volumes of the body mm -hmm. so the more that we can work with the volumes the more that we can work with the internal pressures that helps somebody to maintain neutral as you're going into and out of the cone of function mm. And that's true. I don't want to get just to end range and then jam it and then pull it and all of that. Well, one is teaching somebody where is your end of range. Yeah. And let's strengthen in the mid range. And that's mm. the hyper flexible world. Mm. And because if I'm going to pick up my grandkids, I've got to bend over. And am I going to do that always with a straight back? Anybody who works in preschool, anybody who works, you know, even people who don't have scoliosis have back problems. So yes, yeah. teaching mm -hmm. neutral, but to never go out of it. I know I had clients that once they had done the Schroff method would never work with me because then I would try to, <laughs> them to go into other positions and mm. they were afraid. So yes. is, I think yes. we have to be careful as practitioners. You, you know, you don't realize how much power you have. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I have, I have uh, clients as well sometimes and they were like, well, I have been... I've been told I cannot twist. And I'm like, well, do you drive your car? Um, <laughs> healthy, you know, movement would be to be able to look behind you, right? And you will be able to, you will twist your body. It's part of your day-to-day -day movement. So can, can I um, add something there? Yeah. I have a client who's in her 80s and she is having to go through um, showing that she can keep her driver's license and the big you, what you just said, they told her you're not moving enough to look to be safe. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, what older woman with scoliosis doesn't want to drive for the rest of their life as long as they can to maintain mm. independence? Yeah. And if I have to show some person, well, I better start developing that twist. And we can do that exercise with the twist pretty soon if you want. Mm. It might be a good segment yeah. to it. Yeah, let's do that. Yes. <laughs> So you see, so part of it is that when somebody comes to you too, is that when normal physical therapy assessment, frankly, you would just twist them to see how far they would go. You would bend yep. them forward to see how far they would go. You would push them back to see how far they would go. 
Well, you know, that's something that we would want to do, that we want to just see what is somebody's normal range of motion without cranking it. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and part of it too, is to help someone to learn to understand that I can just be pretty much spinal eight and I'm just moving my shoulders without learning what actual rotation is. So one thing is helping someone to understand when they're just having shoulder girdle detachment and then learning to move from the whole thing. And, you know, so part of it is in movement education is to go beyond, this is just hold it stiff and make it strong. Well, there's a, believe it or not, I do that. Like in, an, in the youth program, it's all about, you know, trying to get people super strong, especially. But let's do this one, is that one of the um, things that I found out just through many years of doing all this, and, uh, and frankly, I don't have a whole lot of research to back it up, but mostly, so, you know, I don't have like an RCT, a randomized controlled trial, that will show you this, but but you can find in the literature for sure that there, that definitely where eye tracking goes has a lot to do with um, how much you can move from one side to the other. So in my book, I, I've dedicated a whole lot of time to laterality, just what right-handedness does to you. And in the yeah. Schwab method, actually they do try to do that to get people to try to like not part your hair. Like you see, I do all the time on one side and to, um, you know, and to try to square off as much as possible. Those things do add up. They really do. Mm -hmm. I'm super right-handed. So anyway, there's a couple of things you can do. One is that um, to, in order to like work on your laterality is that in terms of the eyes, is that if you, if you want to find out which eye is dominant in you, because you see people with scoliosis, the scoliosis goes up into your head. Mm -hmm. So I had this really nice osteopath from Oklahoma City named... Um, Ross Pope, who allowed me to use actually things from his his uh, work, his published work in my book. but And that showed a lot about just everybody is lateral when they come out of the womb, just because of the way that you're held in your mother's uh, womb is, is that there's a lateralization that's already there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when the baby first cries, we think that the, um, that the fontanelles actually kind of pop out and help to develop a little bit of symmetry. So it's a good thing to whack your baby. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get a bunch of complaints about that, but I'm making a joke. Yeah, you might get some complaints here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Whatever is the common thing now. But actually, there's a purpose to crying, you know, that it helps yeah. to start reshaping the head and everything. The mm -hmm. pressures, the cranial pressures, right? The thoracic pressures and in through the throat. So we've got a diaphragm here, you know, at the hyoid, we've got a diaphragm here. In the thoracic area, we've got one here, you know, in the respiratory diaphragm, and we've got one in the pelvic floor, right? Mm -hmm. All those pressures add up to what makes a steady spine. So anyway, how can I make that more symmetrical? Well, if I can figure out how I use my eyes, now I'm not facing square into the camera, but if you can find a way, what you do is you bring your thumbs together, index fingers together, and then you look across the room. Like I, um, I try to, and I try not to like turn my head to put peer one eye through, like I'm looking through a looking glass. Yeah, so straight. You know? So I try into to the center. Yeah. It. yeah. So I try to get my face in the middle. You look at some object across the room, and then if you, let's say everybody close your right eye, and then see if that object stayed in the same place. No. <laughs> it moved yeah. over. And then open your eyes, and then close the other eye, and see if it. It close your left eye and see if it stayed in the same place. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. So you see, my right eye is dominant. So that so that means my right eye is dominant. Yeah. Yeah. So if I close my left eye, I can keep the right the right eye will keep it in focus, mm -hmm. or, or I'd say in view in the proper balance view. Yeah. Now I've had I've done this in conferences where I've had a hundred people line up and work on asymmetrical things with me. It's really interesting. People have all kinds of stuff. What if I had my eyes corrected? What if I can, some people can't close their eyelids? So, you know, honestly, it's all this kind of stuff. It's like, well, we'll just put something over the eye. <laughs> it's like, give me a break. Be creative. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, but, you know, you usually can figure out which eye you're looking through. Just like most people are not ambidextrous. How many ambidextrous people have you ever met? I mean, like. That zero. means both. Hand, hand yeah, it. you can use each yeah. hand. Yeah. Now, now I can tell you more about that too. And it's a great um, book that I use for a lot of research called Laterality in Sports. And that is an awesome thing. I mean, that's for eggheads. But the thing is, is that most of the world is right-handed. And part of it is that we kind of think it's because it goes around the heart. So for those of us who have a predisposition to develop spinal curvity, 
cur some kind of, you know, kind of curviness or imbalance in the trunk, like we're set up. Mm. So what does it have to do with the eyes, though? That's what I don't think. That's what I don't so, understand. Then look, then look if you, what you do is this, you take your arms in this position and now be smart. Let's see. So you, if you go opposite me, so if you just turn, you know, so you go into your left and don't turn hard, try to keep your head over your pelvis, look to that side and then just come back to straight. Try not to stretch it and crank it. Just easy peasy. Go to the other side and see what it feels like to go to that direction. Again, try not to shift offline. Try to keep your head over the pelvis and then come back to straight. Now, can you tell which way that is harder for you to, to turn? Yes, yeah, so left is a lot harder for me to turn. Okay, towards. yeah, and my left is a lot harder for me to turn to, too. Okay, so what you do is if you close your dominant eye, and so I'm going to close mine, and then... The right one, yeah. Yes, yeah, so close mm -hmm. your dominant eye. So you're gonna, you're clo everybody's closing their dominant eye, and now turn to the direction that was more difficult for you. And actually that's, I'm going opposite you because that, yeah, hmm. I come back to straight. And now that's one hmm. trial. Now, what does that feel like to you? Yeah, that for some reason <laughs> it felt easier. Yeah. And so, you know, I actually, I thought I was really brilliant and my eye doctor completely shot me down to the ground is that, you know, actually both, um, that the eyes actually work symmetrically in the brain that, you know, they don't, um, it's not like your motor cortex works the opposite side. That doesn't happen with the eyes. Okay. Yeah. It's actually kind of flipped and gone backwards. Yeah. So, um, so the thing is it, it's not, it's, it's not that what I can attribute it to, and, and actually we could do other tests too, if you're willing to show, to look at it is, is that it probably has to work more with the vestibular system Mm -hmm. And then that's giving feedback into the spine on how to turn. Now, if we teach someone to turn like that in a soft way, I don't think that's going to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. But what we do is that we use that. And actually, I've done that in ballet classes where I'm trying to stand on one leg. And I'll close an eye to help my balance, you know, mm -hmm. side to side. Because one of the things that neurologically that a person with scoliosis needs to work on is just their neurological balancing. Hmm. So as you get older, so forgive me everybody for saying this, like probably after the age of 40, 35, you know, is that things are starting to slow down. I know mm -hmm. I had somebody in the medical world say, well, after 35, you kind of develop what you're going to die from. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's very positive. <laughs> yeah. And um, so it behooves us, you know, to just do it in your class. Now, the other thing I use, too, is the tongue. Yes, but wait one second before you do the tongue, because that, that's great, too. So do I want to close my dominant eye in kind of a number of movements? Is, is yes. it like I'm training my non-dominant eye? to? Yeah, and so what I think is, is that because the paravertebral muscles are all important, and so the ones that actually everybody talks about the multifidi, well, that's really nice. But then we got all these other little bitty ones, the rotatoris, the intertransferosi, the interspinalis. I mean, like these little bitty ones that work a lot on like just the twisting going up and down. And I, I think that I suspect, and frankly, I'm not really one for big animal, um, you know, science research projects. That's one reason why yeah. I didn't go into research. And that's how you would find out probably, yeah. you know, is to harvest and to see if that's really true. So I think that it alters just what the vestibular system is saying, because, you know, our vestibular system is from the eyes, the inner ear, and then our proprioception. Mm -hmm. So I think this is why lots of times we need to take scoliosis training just out of orthopedics. Because, mm. because you know, I realize proprioception is a part of, um, you know, orthopedics, but not really. I mean, proprioception is really a neurological phenomenon. Mm, yeah. So, you know, it's um, so I think adding those things in can be helpful. So that's why I think you need to pick and choose when you use it because it's really annoying to have to close one eye the whole time. Right? <laughs> All the time. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. I mean, let's be realistic about it. But mm. I think it's one way to help somebody get into a challenging, more challenging position mm. and to do it softly 
rather than to say, well, just let's just stretch that thing into that mm. direction. I think that is, you know, and so I think I'm hoping that maybe using some of this will take us into another realm in terms of helping people to understand how they can train themselves into, into nurturing their more difficult positions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. So tell us, tell us about the tongue then. Uh -huh. So the tongue, so the deep fossil frontal line, most people know Tom Myers. I actually go into, I've been studying stecco, um, which is, you know, an Italian method of the whole fascial diagnoses. And that, that'll make your eyes cross and turn you upside down trying to figure that out. Okay. But I highly recommend that you study it if you're a physical therapist, but you know, they have done some of the initial uh, anatomical fascial uh, actual dissections. And so Tom Myers took what he knew from the Ida Rolf world from Rolfing mm -hmm. and that's awesome. And he made it accessible, you know? And so what John Barnes does is that, you know, help me to develop my sensory uh, palpation with people so that I can start to feel that and to develop my eye so then I can start to see where that is. But, um, but in the stecco world, what we do is that then you start to figure out from the bottom of your feet all the way up to the top of your head where the lines are, but not necessarily in, um, but in a more detailed way than Tom Myers, believe it or not. But anyway, I love Tom Myers because it's accessible. So according to him, the deep fascial frontal line is the inside of your uh, upper palate in your mm -hmm. mouth. And then it goes back behind your throat, right? So behind your voice box and all the larynx. Then it goes, dives into your trunk behind the lungs, behind the actual heart. Then the sheet continues. And so there's a, a physical therapist in Australia named Josephine Key, and she has really interesting work too. And she's done some really good stuff with this as well. If you, if everybody's looking for more people to study with too, is that she then just talks about something called the inner envelope. So the fascia that then bathes the front of like the psoas and communicates with the diaphragm and then goes down into what's called the lower pelvic unit, which is the fascia of all the pelvic floor. And that's, then it continues going into the inner thighs, the hamstrings, the calves, and then finally the soles of the feet. Hmm. Okay. So, th and frankly, when you work in with scoliosis, that is like ground zero, right? So that's why I love that I, that I got to study visceral manipulation and I work almost primarily with somebody on their back when I work manually and I'm putting their hands into their soft tissue in their abdomen. So most of the times people will just look at them and say, well, this verb is out of position, put them on their side and then crack them. Well, with scoliosis, that's really probably not a great idea yeah. because, because where they're flexible in their transition zones between where the curves are changing are going to be the things that give. And that's not where it's probably stiff. Mm. So and frankly, so what I tell people in my manual therapy is I tend to adjust people from the soft tissue toward and then that affects the skeleton rather than affecting the skeleton trying to work toward the soft tissue. So you see, so, and, and you can, in, in our fascial world now, we know that there's a lot of water involved with it. I'm a certified lymphatic therapist too. I mean, I like to study. So, so I can tell, have, yes. <laughs> with the tongue, then we have an opportunity. I mean, that sucker is big. I mean, like, it's a big muscle, right? Hmm. So, and to not gross out any vegetarians, just go into any butcher shop and see what those tongues look like. And, and I realize my tongue is not as big as a cow's tongue. But the fact is, it's an unbelievably strong and big muscle. Yeah. Why not use it, right? So I can, I can take the tongue. Now, this is something that's, that is helpful if a person uses an assessment by putting the hands on your shoulders, not mm -hmm. at the bone, but at the soft tissue. And then you just give gentle pressure against someone. And then you hold for about maybe five seconds. And frankly, you'll start to feel which side is starting to drop. Right. And so that's what I call the collapsing side or the giving side. And frankly, you will do somebody with scoliosis the hugest favor in their whole world if they can start to get to understand how to control that a little mm. bit. So what we do is we take the tongue to the opposite side from where you drop down. Right. 
So for me, I tend to drop down on, on actually um, the left side. So I've spent years kind of in this sort of situation where kind of my right kind of comes up and I'm dropped down on yeah. the left. Okay. And so as I reach up my, and then my, you could say, okay, my right arm, you know, okay. By definition, my right arm dominant arm should have more range. Okay. That's great. But this is like my winging one that's mm -hmm. really stuck and weird. And so I'm constantly trying to help it, you know, trying to get all this stuff going. So what I would do is I would take my tongue behind the top right teeth. So you pull it to the opposite side. And then I think, and it's subtle, but if you start to train your eye, you will see it. And so even if somebody's supine, even if somebody's just doing footwork on the reformer, right? And I, honestly, I, I try to tell people who train with me, is like start slow with your clients so you can mm. observe them because they will like violate every rule, rule that you have things going on, right? In your first kind of assumption of somebody. And, uh, but then I do, you know, appreciate that the Schroth method teaches this too, but you have to be careful. Now, you know, forgive me for saying this and all my Schroth homies, you know, please take this with a grain of salt. I had a very bad experience with Schroth when I first was exposed to it in about 2006, 2007. And so I realized that that person, um, yeah, cranial sacral, yeah, it's totally related. That, um, that you know, the person w was somebody who was also a crossover person, that he had learned Schroth and he was from Germany. And I won't say who it is, but he was also a Pilates instructor and a gyrotonics instructor. Gyrotonics also has a lot of good things to contribute to our movement education world. And so, you know, because my left arm is dropping, then I did a lot more reaching up with my left, which actually crunched my right. And I wound up getting a right nerve root compression in my neck, which was really inconvenient. Mm. So, you know, so you do have to be careful. Now, in the, um, in the Schroth training that I've just been exposed to, that there are, I think, ways that they start have figured out since that time to, to not increase the cervical curve, you know, um, and um, so that's great. But I think the tongue thing helps. So the reason why I tried to develop both the eye and the tongue, though, is that lots of times with movement educators, we have to be careful. Like, you can't just be cranking somebody's neck, yeah. to stick it over to one side. That's horrible. Plus, mm. not only that, I feel violated. Yeah. And I, honestly, I've had um, people who have told me that have been uh, the subjects in actually very famous um online programs um, for scoliosis and more subjects of it, that they actually kind of got hurt during the time. Mm. They didn't want to say anything because they're trying to, you know, be good subjects. Be good students, yes. Mm. So mm. one is that we don't use the word deformity. Mm -hmm. We don't use the word hump anymore. And so that's why it is hard because then it's like, oh, my God, is everything politically correct? But, you know, people have feelings. I had to do my own pictures in my youth program, in my book, because I had four people who dropped out because they would not, did not want to be identified as people with scoliosis. Because even though we have the Disabilities Act in the United States, you do get eliminated for dance, photos. You know what I mean? Like certain things, or if you're identified as somebody who's weak, you may not get a job. Hmm. Wow, that's amazing. So we um, have to be careful. Can I can I come back to sorry to interrupt you I, I, I don't want you to move away too, too too quickly from it so the tongue when I move my tongue over to the left does this activate my right side you know um sit up straight and I think it's not necessarily activating your your side I think on a subtle level it is yeah see, a lot of people um you know what is the function of the fascia and what mm -hmm. is the function of the fascial lines what is it? Well, you know, okay, here's another thing I studied. Um, barefoot rehab specialist, I've done level one and two. And, you know, there's a pre-activation that happens with fascia. And so fascia basically connects a lot of these separate muscle groups together and brings them together to make global wholeness. Mm. And so this, if you look in Tom Meyer's book, he says we have to start globally, then act locally and come back to globally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so part of it is just if I pull my tongue 
Pull off my arm, pull my palm, <laughs> to the side. <laughs> Let's see if I can sit straight and face the camera. So you see, this is my scoliosis. Yeah. So, yeah, you collapse into the left waist and you're over on your right. Yeah. So, okay. And so then from here, if I change my eye, you may not see it while I'm in my curve, but if I'm sitting up straight, I mean, I had people in dance classes that would tell me, stand up straight. I'm like, mm. okay, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. But I find that if I do that, I can find just a little bit more centralization mm. in my trunk. Yeah. So it probably doesn't have so much to do with, you know, everyone who collapses the way you do should do this to the same side. Does Not it? the same side. Yeah. Yeah. But, but no, I take that back though. You can make it as simple as that. Whichever mm. side somebody collapses to, try just pulling the tongue to the up and back part of the mouth. Mm. And that will start to preactivate some of the fascia. Mm. Frankly, you can see it by just frowning and smiling. <laughs> Frown. Yes. Smile. Mm. It's the same thing. Mm. I, so uh, um, uh, I totally. I when you were showing it the first time, I was like, "What is this? And um, this can surely not work." And then I did it. Um, so you, we were doing a cobra pose in your practice, and you said to use the tongue, and I was like, "Oh wow, this is amazing!" This it, it like, I don't know what it was in it, is that shape specifically, but it almost felt like it kind of derotated me while I was in the in the yoga in the pose in the in the cobra pose. Well, that's what I think is that there's an internal thing that goes on that's kind of missing sometimes when we just work mm -hmm. on the external orthopedics. Yeah. And that's through the Schwath method. Actually, the whole thing is about just kind of opening up the concavities in the trunk, yeah. which is awesome. I mean, yeah. but it's, it's, it's uh, you know, trying again to see, can we activate this? And so my whole thing is like trying to like be able to be vertical against gravity. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. So that's, we're trying to figure out, okay, if, if this is where I'm going, then, you know, I have a lot of pressure that's going down this way that's going to eventually wear out my low back. And that's true. I do have left low back pain. So I'm mm -hmm. constantly trying to um, to whittle that away. I mean, yeah. that's what it's for daily practice. Yeah. Mm, yes, absolutely. So, the, I mean, that then that was what I was taking away from, you know, what, what you were saying is <clears throat> it's giving us more tools and um, empowerment to to have a as you say, you know, it's a lifelong condition. It's not going to go away. So it's it's like a, giving us the tools to 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 manage it, not to think about correcting. You know, but the thing is, if you start to manage it this way, it does give a correction. You know, mm, yes, that, exactly. And, and, you know, is that we can probably correct to about five to ten degrees. Here's a great question for you. What's your speciality? <laughs> You've got you know, a long list, haven't you? Yes, I do. I do. And scoliosis is like my number one. Actually, I've kind yeah. of broken things down to four categories because I teach kind of on all of them. But scoliosis is my main one. Actually, I'm in the oncology world as well. Yeah. Um, is, and then also feet. And feet are very involved with scoliosis, right? And then performing arts because so many people are hyperflexible. And again, I feel like they have to protect their talent. And that um, a lot of people, uh, I can't say a lot, but, you know, it's surprising the amount of people who have these kind of hyperflexible bodies that, mm -hmm. that, you know, if they don't have a naturally kind of strong body, they're going to get hurt. Mm, yes. But you do work. So in your, in, oh, you in need, your kind of day-to-day -day work, you are working as a physio, yes. physical therapist. So, yeah. so I have two yeah. things. One is that um, I have a private practice and I'm uh, located in Marietta, Georgia right now. And so um, I see clients individually uh, with, um, with, you know, any condition, but lot, I have a lot of people with scoliosis. I'm seeing people by zoom right now. Mm -hmm. So I have that whole practice. And then I have my educational company, which is Pilates therapeutics. And so right now I'm doing a lot of hybrid courses where, uh, I'll be doing this, uh, spinal asymmetry course in June. So if you're interested, you know, you should, uh, let me know. And I, it was really hard on me, but I did actually two times uh, in one day. And so I, so what I do is I send out pre-recorded um, things for people to look at. And then we also have a, a practical time 
for people to um, to work with that mm. advice on a specialist advice on a specialist to work with <laughs> yes I mean this is overwhelming for people right so not just this particular but when you have been diagnosed with scoliosis or when you when you are kind of wanting to manage scoliosis kind of where where do you turn to right what where do you go is it uh, kind of would you recommend to work with a um, physical therapist would you kind of wh what's your take on this <clears throat> You know, because you honestly, do everything, that's great. That's but <laughs> Yeah, you know, honestly, I think Pilates is a piece of the pie. It depends on the person's mm -hmm. age. You know, I mean, if somebody is like 12 or 13 and they're going to have to be put in a, you know, or they want to be put in a brace and they want to follow that, you know, it, then I would follow definitely Schroth best practice probably mm -hmm. at that age, you know, to find someone that's really a qualified yeah. person. Um, for somebody who's an adult who's already like in their teens or something, is that honestly, it's like Christine, Christine has this. There's you and Iyengar is a very good um, yoga practice that uh, that works a lot with balancing the spine. So if somebody wants to be you know, to go strictly in the yoga world, but honestly, I think most physical therapists, forgive me, everyone in physical therapy, you know, I think that it's they don't understand <clears throat> how to work. A no, lot. and I think it's too it's too broad what they learn, right? It's, it's right. Very... You don't learn that in, in physical therapy school, like mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. So I agree. Um, I agree. Yeah, and so um, yes, yeah, so I would you know start, and if you just start talking about it in your community, look online. I mean, if somebody wants to meet with me virtually, I definitely will. Um, you know, and I had one person who contacted me, and she was much older, and she said she had a Pilates reformer, and then it turned out she couldn't even do mat work. I said, how are you going to get on your reformer? You know, <laughs> and off stuff. again, yes. <laughs> but I do work with some people that have scoliosis that I work with just with a chair and standing up because they're older. Mm, yeah. Let me just bring up your book. So this is this is um, Suzanne's book. And you've got a, a special code for us as well, haven't you? Yes. And they say it works. So you can see uh -huh. the code is POD15. And, you know, it's, um, it's also good <clears throat> through the end of February. Okay. So, but try to take advantage of it now because lots of times people have stopped to have used the code lot later and, and they're disappointed. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. I will definitely be getting it. Um, I think it, it looks like a, it looks great. Um, and I will put it in the, in the description as well for people who, who are interested in this. You know, and I also have Mac classes on my website, Pilates Therapeutics. And so I have a whole catalog. Those are very, affordable now mm -hmm. you know those are for people who are I hate to say kind of just looking for mat classes and it's i conduct it in a way that is healthy for the spine okay mm. so um and if somebody writes to me and says you know well i have you know a 75 degree and and i've you know i have parkinson's and i have you know and five hip replacements well you know come on let's be reasonable yes yeah but it works for most people yeah good excellent thank you so much um this was amazing um Suzanne and you know we could talk for hours obviously I'm passionate about it absolutely so am I and you know I, I love I love listening to you and um Porsche 23 I know you you have another uh, you had another question here but um yeah I'm just mindful of time and thank you so much everyone obviously who've been listening if you do want to What's the best way to get in touch with you, Suzanne, um, um, if people have questions? You know, my um, my email address is smdpt at att.net. So it's like Suzanne Martin. DPT at. Yeah, Doctor of Physical Therapy at att.net. Now, I won't go into big explanations, but also um, I have to tell you that, uh, yeah, that, you know, getting the book helps a lot to demystify things. And frankly, one thing that's really great about Handspring Books is that they have QR codes that if you just match it up on your phone, it pulls up exercises. Mm, great. That's yeah. great. Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Lovely. So we're getting lots of thank yous here. And this was all very interesting. And um, yes, people are amazed, I think, by um, yeah all the knowledge. And, and thank you so much for giving us a, a different perspective as well, right? And um, yeah, I think I think that's important, and and the inspiration to keep learning new stuff, obviously as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, this is lovely, and you're lovely, and thank you for for doing this service. I know it it takes a lot of work. 
<laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so stay on for a moment, Suzanne. I'm just going to say goodbye to everyone else. And thank you so much for watching. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.